Welcome to the Humans of Hospitality podcast. I know so many of you listening to this show love your local bar, your local restaurant, maybe your local hotel, and have so many fond memories of time in hospitality businesses. This is the podcast where we get to chat to the human beings behind the scenes of that industry. Maybe the chefs or the bakers or the coffee roasters or the gin distillers or the craft brewers or the entrepreneurs, but all doing an amazing job of making sure that hospitality stays interesting and the big dull formulaic brands do not take over our high street please enjoy the show This week, I get to talk to the inspirational Helen Browning, OBE, Chief Executive of the Soil Association and visionary organic farmer and, with her partner Tim, owner of the Royal Oak and the Chop House, two venues where the menu really does reflect what's available and in season right now. This could even include courgettes cooked deliciously in five different ways when there is a glut on. Helen literally blew my mind. She's some sort of superhero. She's involved with the National Trust, the RSPB, uh, advising the government, so many things that our conversation I found very uplifting and thought-provoking and explores many, many things, including Helen's own journey from catching rats in the family's dairies to earn her pocket money as a child, to taking over the farm in the mid-80s and finding herself very much ahead of the curve, not only in how she farmed, but also how she sold her organic produce directly to the consumer. As you'll learn, being ahead of the curve is not always an easy place to be. We also try to put the world to rights so we can solve the problem of how on earth are we going to feed 10 billion humans on this planet by the year 2050? How do we do that without destroying the planet? And that could mean we see lots of walnut, almond and fruit trees growing amongst our cereal crops in the future. I hope you're intrigued. Please enjoy this week's conversation. So good morning, Helen. Thank you so much for sparing the time. Uh, I have uh, travelled across the country this morning to come and see you across the countryside, and we are here in your amazing farm. Can you just explain where I where am I in the country? I drove through the I drove through the night. <laughs> You're in North Wiltshire, uh, so the farm is the, is the county boundary between Wiltshire and Oxfordshire, um, just on the edge of the Marlborough Downs, running down onto the Vale of the White Horse. So we're between Swindon and Wantage, um, with the White Horse Hill at Uffington just a few miles to the east and Swindon about seven miles to the west. Amazing. It's beautiful, isn't it? I, I got here a little bit early this morning and ended up just coming across the White Horse, which is on a huge hill. And uh, what a stunning scenery. It's an absolutely beautiful part it's, of the country. It is an incredible part of the country. And it's a part of the country that people don't know much about. We're not highly visited. Um, people go up to the Cotswolds just north of here, um, but they don't necessarily come into Wiltshire. And yet there's some stunning landscapes, Chalk Downland, and then down down into the into onto the heavier clay land with sort of woods and hedges and it's a it's a remarkable part of the world yeah beautiful and as i opened my car door as i parked in your car park this morning literally cows started mooing so i don't know if you arranged that for every guest that arrives uh, but it felt very authentic so, well uh, we, you're right next to the dairy we've got a dairy herd just next door and uh, the calf uh, rearing unit just behind here so uh, this this office this series of offices is right in the middle of the farm um in the village and we run uh, sort of north and south from here um as they up onto the chalk and down onto the clay but lots of enterprises lots going on as you'll find out you you have an exceptional amount of stuff going on so i want to chat a little bit first of all about just you know how you how you got into this how you ended up doing what you're doing and then we'll go into into some of the sort of stuff around the industry and hopefully even get outside and have a little look around um but yes this is sort of you know yeah multi multi-generation how long have you been here well i grew up here so my father came to the farm here in 1950 uh we're tenants of the church the church of england and uh, he took on the tendency in 1950 so i was born here grew up here and always wanted to farm uh we i'm from a long line of farmers and i guess it's in my blood and was given the opportunity to take on the tenancy of the farm in the sort of mid 80s, mid late 80s, and um, started. I was already kind of nervous about the direction of travel that farming was taking, so decided to experiment with organic farming. And uh, within a year or two of being back at the farm here, um, committed to convert the whole farm over a period of time. So uh, we started conversion in earnest in 86, 87, and finished in 94. 
And was there a particular uh, sort of eureka moment where you decided organic was the way to go? Or was this, did it, did it evolve over time? Because it wasn't that way under your dad's remit, presumably. No, it wasn't. Dad was at the sort of forefront of all the latest technology, although we were still a mixed farm with livestock and cropping, which is makes it much more straightforward to move into organic when you've got that kind of fertility building and, um, and uh, cash crops as well. Um, so it wasn't a eureka moment. It was a gradual uh, sort of exploration and dawning of, you know, recognizing what was going wrong around the place. And you have to remember that in the sort of mid 80s, we were probably at our worst, particularly around things like animal welfare. So for me, a big wake up call was visiting the supposedly state of the art pig and poultry units when I was doing my degree in agricultural technology. And uh, thought, you know, as I saw these kind of hell holes, I thought if this is state of the art, I want nothing to do with this. Um, So for me, there was a big part of trying to set up a farming system that was really looking after our farm animals in the way that they deserve, uh, as well as concerns about the, you know, the sprays we were using, the kind of way wildlife was disappearing on our farms, and a real interest in human health too, and that connection, which is, you know, the sort of fundamental one between soil, plant, animal, man, the way we look after our soils and how ultimately that impacts on our health. So was that something, because I presume at that time, that was particularly I know, rev- revolutionary. I suppose you were going back in time, really, but it, it, it was it was against the grain, I suppose, of the trajectory of farming at the time. It was very much against the grain. Um, and uh, there were still, there were already some organic farmers around the place. I mean, the Soil Association, which I now run, uh, was has been around since 1946. So there's been a long-term interest in, you know, this whole uh, area. Um, but uh, in, as I say, in the early mid 80s, um, the, the direct of travel was all around specialization, intensification, um, monocropping, and uh, getting rid of diversity. And of course, uh, one of the fundamental tenets of organic farming is, is that um, diversity, that complexity is, is part of your resilience and your strength. Right. So do you think that recognizing that that wasn't the right trajectory, or certainly not the right trajectory for you, was that from education? Or was that just something you think you felt in your heart? It was kind of like, this just doesn't feel right. I think it was a bit of both. I think, you know, there's the, you, you know, you look at the science, you look at the, at the, at the kind of impacts um, and the evidence was already there in terms of crashing biodiversity, um, some of the animal welfare problems, the amount of, amount of antibiotic we were starting to use in those systems. I mean, all the flags were up in many ways, but there's also that gut instinct too about what am I going to really enjoy doing? And for me, one of the, you know, one of the wonderful things about my life in farming has been that it is such a joy to do it working with nature and trying to to sort of uh, understand ecology um, rather than just trying to stamp on nature's head. I mean, farmers would talk about the war with nature. (laughs) And uh, when you get into that mindset, you're really on the wrong track. Yeah. So how would you describe, or not, how would you describe, how is the farm now? How how different is it from what it was? And what do you now do here? Just fill us in on, on you, because you're still mixed. It's, yeah, mixed we're farming. a very mixed farm. So we have a, a dairy herd and we rear all the calves from that dairy herd for beef or for um, heifer replacements for the dairy. In fact, we're just literally right now about to uh, fire up a second dairy. We've made the huge investment of, of uh, building a second dairy over the last year. And that's about, to, we're about to start carving there too. Um, so we have dairy, beef, uh, we have sheep. Uh, they're run by my daughter and her husband. They, we've got about a thousand Romney ewes. Um, we have our pigs. I guess we're most famous for our pigs. Uh, about 200 saddleback sows uh, producing three and a half or 4,000 uh, finished pigs a year, which all go into our own brand. Um, Then we grow cereals. We grow wheat, barley, spelt, oats, um, and some pulse crops sometimes. Uh, And my latest uh, venture is agroforestry. So planting uh, productive trees, things like nuts and fruits and trees for biomass and timber um, within the cropped environment. So rather than saying, well, actually, trees all belong in woods and forests and we put them over there and then we farm over here. It's about mixing that up. And I think that's a really exciting way of both increasing the overall yield from an acre of land um, while sequestering more carbon, improving biodiversity uh, and generating lots more healthy foods for us to eat because you know one of the really interesting things at the moment is how do we get that balance between livestock and crops and how do we generate fertility and grow all these things without animals being such a big part of the system Mm. 
Yeah. So you're aware. I mean, that that change seems to have come about again. You know, as a restaurateur, particularly in the last eighteen months, you know, just seems to have graph gathered a massive momentum. The sort of the change in people's dietary habits, just the interest in that balance between. I think as kids, you know, we were told thirty percent protein, certain amount of carbohydrates, whatever it is. I was certainly guilty of you know meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, you see that changing from, and, and is that coming from the consumer or from the farmer? I, it's changing uh, very quickly. I think it's largely coming from the consumer. I think it feels quite threatening for farmers who are heavily invested in livestock, as we are. Um, and uh, But I think that, again, all the evidence is there that if we want to feed 10 billion people and we want to do uh, that healthily and we want to still um, make space for nature and we want to look after env- our environment climate change, then actually we've got to curb our meat-eating habits. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, the Soil Association has been talking uh, a lot about less but better for many, many years. Um, let's in particular not feed grain and protein crops that are largely sourced from areas of the world which where we're trying to protect the rainforests and the natural grasslands. Uh, let's not be pulling in soya and, and, and feedstocks from there to feed uh, our pigs and poultry and even our cattle. Uh, where we are producing meat, let's do that on a grass base um, from a you know from forage, which we can grow well in the UK, and see them as a as a helpful part of maintaining soils and biodiversity, uh, rather than letting animals compete too heavily with humans for uh, scarce raw materials. Right. And do you think that's and it, and it goes back, I guess, to the change now from when you made the farm go or, or organic originally, and and that was against the grain. Excuse the pun. Um, but is that um, is that change? now is is there more of a movement towards organic or do you are you in this sort of uh I, I suppose niche still where you're surrounded by people who are interested in it is is there still this this kind of strive for industrialization and actually this you know if we're going to feed 10 billion people by 2050 we just need to make it even more efficient or is there a recognition that we were on the wrong trajectory and there is another way of doing it i think that uh, i mean organic in the uk is still not huge it's still only about three percent of land and about one and a half percent of the market so it's still quite small from that point of view uh, across the globe and in other European countries it's racing ahead so organic is 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 you know very much on the on the rise but I think that in terms of the wider debate about the direction of travel I think finally uh, there is a moment where everybody's waking up and thinking actually uh, you know we have been on the wrong path um, and whilst I don't think that debate is anywhere near one I think there is much more acceptance that it's it's not enough you you can't can't just keep uh, hammering the land um, and forcing more out of it uh, and not giving back and wasting resources uh, that we do need to find a, uh, a, a, a more sensible route forward. So I think that debate is very live. It's very much in the balance, both in the UK and in some other countries. And there are lots of interests still fighting a rearguard action. Um, but I think the challenge now is not just to promote organic and trying to get that to grow, but actually to think about how do we transform all of our food and farming so that looks far more like it does in an organic system. That might not mean that it's all certified organic, um, but actually the, the, the stakes are too high uh, not to be trying to move everything in the right direction now as quickly as possible. You know, climate change, the evidence is there, biodiversity, health, um, these are really strong drivers and some really helpful reports out over the last couple of months, which really do make the case for change. And I think we will see, I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I do think we are at the beginning of acceptance that we do need to do things in a fundamentally different way but we still need people to be backing that call for change. Good. Well, hopefully having the conversations will, will help and mm. make people more aware. Um, you mentioned that Europe is is maybe further ahead in organic. In, and I, 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 again, I'm not fully informed, but I think I used to have the uh, perspective, I guess, that animal rights was actually pretty good in Britain and some other parts of Europe were worse. Is that still the case? And if, if animal rights are different here, why is the organic uh, sort of the agricultural side of stuff better in Europe than it is here? Yeah, so I think we are a nation of animal lovers and certainly animal welfare is a very high priority for 
people here, more so perhaps than in many other countries. Um, but across Europe, and actually in some other countries too, um, governments have seen organic uh, generally as a good thing, as you know, as, as, as a good thing to support uh, because of all the, the benefits it brings. Uh, whereas in the UK, actually, government's been really dragging its feet. Um, I think we have a more industrial farming than in some other, particularly Southern European countries. Um, and we've had this obsession with cheap food forever here. Um, so for, for a whole host of reasons, we've never had the kind of support from governments and policymakers that has been uh, happening now across much of Europe. Okay. Because most of the farmers I speak to, and, and, and you know, I don't speak to Lowe's, but they always seem to have a genuine uh, passion for farming, a love for the land, a love for what they do. Um, so what, where, does the, where does the pressure come from from them to compromise? Because you kind of feel that a lot of farmers know that the current system isn't right and the, the animal welfare standards aren't as good as they should be. And they don't want to be in that situation. They're looking for an opportunity to change. So is it, is it, you know, is it the government's responsibility? I'm, I'm presuming the farmers can't change because the the economics don't work, presumably, to start with. And first of all, they've got to actually make a living, otherwise they can't do anything else. So is the desire there, I guess, is the question from the farmers. And how do we how do we change that? Does it need to be government? I think there's a desire from more and more farmers to do things differently. You do need to be able to make the business case stack up, though. So, you know, there's a number of ways that can happen. It can happen through consumer demand for organic or better products. And and uh, so the more we, we get that coming through, the better. Um, it can be through government policy, so supporting the right kind of farmings. If we're, if we're giving uh, support, uh, funding to farming, do where do we put that resource? Do we put it uh, for more integrated, you know, organic type systems or do we just prop up the status quo? Um, then there are issues around infrastructure. It's actually quite difficult. A lot of organic producers are wanting to sell more locally. It's actually quite hard to get your stuff processed locally. There aren't the abattoirs or the vegetable processing or the dairies on a more local basis where everything's got been scaled up so far that it makes it quite hard for individual players to get their products to market efficiently. Um, and there's a whole knowledge and skills side of things too. You know, you tend to be comfortable doing what you know how to do. And organic farming requires a whole new skill set. And we're not teaching that in the colleges, um, you know, and, and there aren't that many opportunities for people unless they really seek it out to uh, get this once they've actually started their farming career. So I think there's a whole load of barriers is there and some degree of peer pressure you know I think it still feels like a slightly radical act to be an organic farmer and farmers are very influenced by their neighbors and what the people around them think so if they're a bit shy and a bit less you know bolshy than somebody like me uh, <laughs> then maybe they're a bit nervous about going against the grain yeah okay um and then so going back to um and, and i, I want to come back into some of some other industry specific thing but just want to finish your story i suppose as to how, how you ended up in this because the perception i guess is um you know we imagine children brought up on farms are kind of you know de de baking fresh scones every day and uh, picking the strawberries and making jams and stuff like that so so how much of your childhood you know what, what what's it like being brought up on a farm and and do you think it's a result of your childhood that you've literally now dedicated your entire life to this journey uh, yes, I mean, I, I, ha I had an extraordinary childhood, I guess, in a way that many people would never have a, an inkling of. I think once, you know, you're incredibly lucky if you grow up on a farm in many ways. And so, uh, yeah, my childhood was spent um, on the farm, tagging along behind dad, going to market, opening the gates for him as he drove around the farm, uh, walking, riding, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I weren't my pocket money through uh, ferreting for rabbits. You know, that was uh, it, it just just a completely different childhood to most people. Dad used to give us sixpence for every rat's tail we brought home. Um, you know, so we were used to catching rats in the dairies with terriers and things. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think I'm, I, I, I had that kind of upbringing and opportunity from a really young age to be a, a out there in nature on the farm um, and I guess it instilled a love of it all in me which is hard to break yeah Excellent. Um, so as time's gone on and you've you've completely changed the farm and you've got involved in uh, you know so many different parts of the industry that we'll touch on. You also the, the traditional route from the farm is via the mid, the middlemen presumably or directly to the supermarkets. But you've also taken that route of going you know getting as close to the consumer as possible. Um, and I don't know if the if the butchers was the first part of that of going directly to the consumer. But what was the motivation for kind of you know getting getting direct to the people that were actually eating your produce? Well, I guess I realised that if I wanted 
wanted to convert the whole farm to organic, um, I was going to have to find a way of selling stuff because there wasn't a ready market for uh, organic food at that time. And so, and actually that really chimed with me too, because I didn't feel we'd carry on getting support from the common agricultural policy for all the time that we have had it and that we needed to stand on our own two feet more and find our own um, financial route to security. Um, so yeah, we started selling literally from the farm gate uh, initially, and then we bought a butcher shop um, and another one. And we've done stacks of stuff over the years. We ran a mail order business for quite a long time. Um, we slightly had a tendency to do things a bit ahead of the curve um, and bear, pay the price for that. Um, and then we did put uh, products into the supermarkets and we still do. Um, we do some export work. Uh, we've done all sorts of things with our products over time. Um, and now, as well as having a brand which goes into box schemes and retailers, uh, we also run uh, the Royal Oak in the village here, our, a pub with um, a dining pub with rooms. We've got about 12 rooms there now and another restaurant in Swindon. Um, so we've been, we are involved, I guess, at uh, almost every level. Um, and uh, I think we do take huge pleasure uh, from serving people directly. Uh, you know, I think, I think of all the things we've done, I wouldn't say it's the most lucrative, uh, but of all the things we've done, I think actually, um, you know, giving people, uh, a, an opportunity to have great fun around food, uh, is what we've enjoyed most of all. Yeah. The perspective you have, I mean, it, it must be fairly unique to have all of that, to literally, to, to kind of, you know, to rear the animals, to, to farm the stuff, to, to sell it in the butchers, then to have a hotel, stay in guests. I mean, you, you supply in supermarkets as well as the box. You've got a phenomenal amount of knowledge, which I guess is why you're involved in so many of these groups and government advisory and all that kind of stuff. But before we come on to that, I'm interested in that. That difference, I guess, when you start um, serving customers directly and you you open the hotel, you know, this is called the humans of hospitality. How different is that side of the business, the hospitality, the direct, the consumer side to the to the farming side and, and anything, you know, that you've particularly learned on that side? Are you still happy that you went and opened a restaurant and a bar and a hotel? Because I know how hard that is. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I mean, first of all, it is very different from the farming end. Farming tends to be quite um, isolating. A lot of farmers are one man back or have one or two members of staff and uh, may not embrace uh, the public traipsing through their doors every day. So I think you have to really look at your personality type and whether you actually want to be talking to people in 24 hours a day. Um, and I'm lucky in that my partner, Tim, uh, runs the, the pub and the chop house. Um, that's his baby, really, and he loves doing that stuff. Um, if it was me having to do it, well, it probably wouldn't have happened, to be honest, not because I don't think it's fantastic just because I don't have the time and the energy. And I think great places where you want to go and eat and stay, you need to have uh, the, 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 the person there to actually bring it to life as, as often as possible. I think, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of energy that goes into that welcome, that kind of making it an experience that people will really want to come back uh, for more. And people who come here, they want to get out of the farm. So we do loads of farm tours. We started up something called Eastbrook experiences so people can come and do photography courses or sit borrow hides or learn about the food we produce you know so we're doing a whole load of stuff there it does require fantastic people and a lot of energy it's not an easy option as no. you well know yeah absolutely and then the challenge when we tried to do this i think you know trying to get as close to the uh, to the producer as possible as, as a restaurateur is always important we don't have the the i would say advantage of having a farm although i imagine that comes with its with its own set of headaches but i know you talk about um trying to run menus where you're supplying your own meat and the fact that you know you don't you'll only um slaughter a certain number of animals you can't always guarantee to have a certain cut of meat on Absolutely. do you supply all of your own stuff and how have you got around that because we had the same challenges yeah um so yeah how do you manage that or is that tim's job uh, well <laughs> it's, it's largely tim's and the chef's job but yeah. uh yeah so we do always have to clear whole carcasses so we need to be thinking about menus that are going to actually do that um we do sometimes we've got a, a great relationship with uh a, a, where, where we do a lot of our processing where we combine fillets um so you know the steak cuts are the real challenge 
challenge because people do still buy eat a lot of steak um and so we have they have a lot of orga- organic animals going through and we can take out some of those uh, fillets and other steaks so we can just oversupply a little bit on that so some of those may not always be from here but the vast majority all of the pork uh, all of the lamb and uh, most of the beef um does come from the farm with the exception of a few steaks um and we just have to juggle things so we have to be making sure we're doing you know we do we do do a great burger I think that's a great way of shifting a variety of cuts um and making sure that we can get that carcass balance right and use the whole thing yeah that's no, a it's a good it's a good art to uh to try and nail i think it is helpful you know we get consumers come in sometimes and uh you know, they'll be like, well, he'll come in on a Monday and go, there's no, there's no fish. You know, why have you run out your special? How, mm. you know, how can you possibly run a restaurant and have run out of this stuff? And you're kind of like, well, you don't you want know, fish on a Monday. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want fish on Monday. You know, fishermen <laughs> didn't go out on Sunday. And actually it was really rough Friday and Saturday. So the last time that the boat went out was on Thursday and everything yeah. that was landed on Thursday has been sold. And and I, I worry that, you know, the consumer now becomes so used to just being able to have what they want when they want it from around the globe. And actually those proper restaurants that are connected um, to the producers are important, I think. So yeah, we just need the consumers to understand understand that challenge yeah and actually they, they do get it when you start yeah. talking about it i think that uh, you know we we change our menu twice a day every day uh, we really respond to what's available right now and the same goes with our uh, with our fresh produce because we have a lovely organic grower just down the road he just brings in more or less what he's got and so the chefs just have to uh, adapt the menu all the time to what's in season what's available uh, we, uh, we 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 encourage people to bring in uh, their own foraged and grown stuff from their gardens when they've got surpluses um, and sort of do a switch for uh, beer and food. And that's great. But, you know, you're, again, you're responding to suddenly a huge courgette glut. You know, I, I went in uh, last year sometime and found courgettes being cooked in five different ways yeah. on the menu yeah. in one session. Um, so I think that I think that's one of the joys of it. And I think for people visiting us, hopefully they really get off on that. Um, but it does mean absolutely you are you are serving what's right to serve today and what you need to serve to get to make sure everything works yeah i think we had a a season it was about four maybe even five years ago where um strawberries for some reason we just had this huge on the land where we grow stuff this huge oversupply of strawberries and literally you know whatever you ordered it basically came with strawberries it was strawberry drinks strawberry dessert strawberries on the main we we were giving punnets away when people left so yeah yeah, following that season uh i think is key um so how do we balance that again? So so it's lovely if we can supply that way and the consumer's happy to buy that way and to follow the seasons and to, yeah, to live on courgettes for a week or asparagus. I always give the example, you know, it takes three years, doesn't it, yeah. to grow asparagus. It's only in season for 10 weeks, yet we get used to the fact that you can fly asparagus across the ocean and have it all year round. So my fundamental sort of passion and desire is please only eat amazing asparagus for the kind of 10 weeks of the year. The flip side of that is actually it's, it's helping countries like Peru um, sort out their economy and their investment in education. So it's a very uh, complicated issue. But if we want to farm sustainably, um, and, and particularly if we want to go organic, what do we do about all these, all these, you know, the, the, the big kind of chain restaurants that run the same menu all year, and they seem to be coming increasingly dominant? There's been a little bit of a change in the casual dining sector, maybe in the last year, it feels like the bubble might have burst a little bit on what I fundamentally think are often property companies. It's kind of mm. like, we're going to buy it at 50 units, we're going to grow to 100, we're going to flip it. How do we get enough people having the conversation to understand understand that not only is that annoying because we we make the country beige but actually it's not sustainable from a from a food perspective anyway because we're eating the wrong stuff at the wrong time of the year i don't know if you can fix that as well on your list of stuff you're doing <laughs> Helen. well one of the things the soil association has been doing over the last few years is running a, a campaign called out to lunch which is looking at those big restaurant chains and how what sort of food they serve particularly to children um because before we get even get into seasonality and everything else we've got a fundamental problem that a lot of them are serving really unhealthy food particularly to kids and you know that starts with refillable uh, soft drinks uh, no, often no or very little uh, fruit or veg on the menu that's targeted at, ch- at children um, you know there's there's just a whole host of problems there in terms of the way we're setting up <clears throat> our children to think that this is the kind of food that is da- desirable because they're being taken out to eat which is a treat um, and yet the food that you're serving them 
is ultra deep fried crap. <laughs> so Chicken uh, and chips. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that there's something about the way we uh, we start to, to educate and feed our kids um, right from the start. And uh, it's been interesting, that campaign, because it's really, uh, I think, provided a bit of stimulus for some of those chains to really up their game. And it's not necessarily about price either. You know, actually, you've got some of the, uh, uh, the more inexpensive chains uh, coming at the top of the league table. Um, It's about the effort that's being made. So I think we've got to get some of those real basics right um, before we even start to think about how are they going to be more responsive to seasonality. I think there is an opportunity for more people to break the mould. I think the interest in food now, the millennial generation that we keep talking about, is really interested uh, in real food. And uh, so I think those chains that start to uh, do something a bit different there. And I know how hard it is if you're trying to replicate the same menu and you're trying to train the chefs and you've got to get consistency and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's much easier to have one menu that you run for six months or three months and everybody knows how to do it and you don't uh, change any ingredients. But actually, I think those people who are bolder and say, let's go, let's at least start to experiment with, with seasonality. I mean, there's some real economic reasons to do it too. When food's in season, it's much cheaper. So if you're looking at your margins, you would be well advised to look at seasonality and building that into your menus because you can usually source uh, much better. But fundamentally, people don't ask enough questions when they go out to eat. And so I think a lot of the chains, a lot of, you know, people get away with murder, not murder. Uh, They get away with too much because we're a bit British and a bit nervous about saying, so where did this come from? Why are you serving this at this time of year? Yeah. We're all to blame. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's complicated. And, and, you know, you mentioned education there around... uh I, I guess kids, I guess this education is, it's again, supply and demand a little bit, isn't it? They, the kids are coming in and they're wanting to order chicken and nuggets and chips. And where does that come from? Probably, you know, educating kids either at home or into primary schools. So then you get into the syllabus, I guess, where you see, um, you know, PE and fitness kind of, you know, being squeezed off the uh, the syllabus a little bit and maths and English being the focus and nutrition. And I find it fascinating that even with doctors, you know, nutrition doesn't seem to come up. You know, I get more questions about diet when I take my vet, my dog to the vet than I do when I Absolutely. go to the doctor and saying I'm feeling unwell and you think well you know what we put in our bodies is is so important yeah it's a big it's a big challenge I I, like you I'm the the eternal optimist um but I do think we need to be asking better questions and then maybe that that willingness to um to understand that you know the food's not always going to be the same you know when you go into a venue even if it is just a burger you're going to order it might be different each time because it might come with different salad ingredients the potatoes might be in a different you know Mm. season so we need to be willing to say okay you know I really loved what I ate here two weeks ago i didn't love this one as much but maybe i'm just not a bigger fan of butternut squash as i am you know strawberries and blueberries yeah. or something like that so that's interesting um you mentioned earlier uh pigs very briefly i know you're you're very famous for for pigs and the saddlebacks so where does that come from where does your love of the pigs? i even uh, doing a little bit of research last night found there's a there's a whole audio book that you've narrated uh, around <laughs> pigs i believe out there so it's got great reviews as well i didn't have time to listen to it all but that seems to be a genuine passion of yours so what, what's that about Yes, well, my my sort of involvement with pigs came from outrage, really, um, in that, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier on that I was taken to see all these sort of supposedly state-of-the-art uh, pig and poultry units when I was doing my degree. And uh, pigs seem to me to be the most abused of our farm animals. And so although I'd had no history, we had ne- we'd never kept pigs on the farm, I knew nothing about them practically, I decided uh, slightly madly that I was going to start keeping them, learning about them, and and uh, see if I could show uh, a, a kinder way of, of caring for them. You know, I don't mind if people don't eat meat at all, but while we eat meat, I'm absolutely adamant that we should be eating meat from animals that have had a good life. So uh, I started with two pigs, as you will, uh, if you ever get around to either listening to or reading the book, Pig, yeah, that I, I published yeah. <laughs> last year. Um, they, I, I started off with two pigs back in 86, 87. And from that have bred up a herd of, uh, of, of 200. And, um, and it 
it's really about trying to give people the option of eating, hopefully, great tasting products from pigs that have had a fantastic life, as good as we can give it. Um, so, yeah, so, and, and, and that has very much taken off. I mean, pigs are wonderful because you can turn them into so many products um, and uh, everybody loves their bacon and their sausages and their hams and their, you know, charcuterie and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we have built quite a business um, on the back of uh, our, my love of pigs and I still love them. Excellent. Well, good. Well, thank you for looking after them because I, I, you, you do see those, you know, images and I'm never sure you know, because I'm not close enough to the farming communities, you know, if they're true, but you see these kind of little cages or you see pigs kind of reared indoors and they don't seem to have any room to move. And is all of that, you know, that's actually what's happening. Is that, is that the industrialization of our food? And, and is that commonplace? Or? So most pigs are still reared indoors. Most finishing pigs, once after they've been born, about 40% of sows live outside, but their piglets come in at three to four weeks and will spend most of their life indoors. Now, to be honest, things have got better in the UK over the last 30 years. I think that things like sow stalls where sows were actually confined in crates for the whole of their pregnancy and then they go into firing crates and they're confined there while they're giving birth and feeding their young the sow stalls have been banned and that's a really big step forward um, so uh, there's more enrichment on a lot of farms now more straw being used but there are still many farms who feel that the cost press pressures are such that they do keep pigs in a very intensive way and if you look at what's going on in other countries uh, it can can be even worse. So one of the things we are very alive to at the moment is the post-Brexit worry about uh, meat coming in from systems that we would not allow in this country now, undercutting uh, our livestock farmers and um, and leaving farmer, uh, leaving consumers exposed to meat with, you know, that's been had a lot more antibiotic used or growth hormones or those kind of things as well, as well as coming from less high welfare systems. So things are improving. They are not where they need to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, the direction of travel has been a positive one. Um, and uh, I'm keen to try and keep it moving in that direction. Okay, great. And when you talk about the um, potential influx of meat, are you talking out of Europe? Because I often wonder, again, I'm a big fan of, of buy local, buy seasonal, so buy British. Yeah. Is, is buying British the same as buying European from a from a kind of animal ethics perspective and post Brexit is the concern out of Europe or actually is there is there a challenge in Europe and do we have an opportunity post Brexit to be even better in the UK so uh, there are more European standards on animal welfare than there were. I, mean, I think the, the base has come up. I would still say that in terms of uh, most of our systems, um, the UK is ahead still. Um, and uh, but it, the the, uh, the risk is uh, that if we allow the, uh, imports in, probably from third countries, places like the States in particular, um, some of the Eastern European countries, um, we could be bringing in. I mean, if you look at the amount of antibiotic that's being used in the States, it's something like 16 times higher on beef units and about five times higher on pigs. And in this country, we've made a lot of progress over the last few years in reducing antibiotic use as they have in other northern European countries. The Scandinavian countries doing really well. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff in the balance here. Um, and uh, there are, you know, everywhere you go, there is good practice and bad practice. I hope that uh, we will maintain or improve our standards post post-Brexit, um, and that we will ensure that we are not importing product from countries which do not meet the high standards that we aspire to. Um, and I think there are opportunities, given that the less but better, we might not want to be eating all the meat we produce in this country. I think there are opportunities for export as well. Okay. Good. You've got the ear to government, so hopefully you can have me. Do you, do you have confidence that they, uh, that they agree with you? The whole situation is a complete mess at the moment. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, we, we don't have confidence that we're going to wake up tomorrow morning, uh, oh. you know, and, and, and I think that uh, there's been lots of good rhetoric. The, the, um, the, the Brexit, you know, the need to reformulate our own agricultural policy post-Brexit has created a really interesting conversation. And Michael Gove, as the Minister of State, 
in DEFRA has uh, really opened up that box, been talking about a lot of the right kind of things. Um, but uh, the devil's in the detail. Uh, we do know, don't even know what trading environment we're going to be in. There's so much uncertainty at the moment that I think it's really impossible to know exactly how this is going to play out. What's important is that people keep demanding high standards for UK uh, production and to make sure that those farmers aren't being undercut by cheap and nasty imports. Mm. There seems to be a better understanding now of the impact of using antibiotics and how that's a a global challenge and the, the potential impact on humanity. But it's still, I still worry it's a little bit niche. You know, we get asked a lot about, you know, why we don't sell prawns, which we do sometimes depending on where they come from. But a lot of the prawns that you buy in the shops, and I may be a little bit out of date, but last time I looked into it, so ignorance is really bliss. And every time we open any kind of, you know, new issue to start yeah. looking into it, we're like, oh my God, it was perfect when we didn't know that. But when we found <laughs> out that most of the prawns we were eating were grown in these huge kind of containers and vats yeah. in Vietnam and, and Asia, and they were pumped full of, of antibiotics. Yeah. yeah, and all this kind of, all these chemicals that were in them. And people have got no idea. And they're like, well, I just, you know, I really like prawns in a sweet chili sauce. And you're yeah. Like, yeah, but that's not what we stand for. And, and you you wouldn't like them if you knew what yeah. we knew. And then the complexity around fish and fishing for certain species and bycatch and all kind of that. But we'd, we'd be here for at least another three hours. But at least you, so you've taken all of that, that knowledge that developed from your, from your childhood and your multiple kind of exposures around the industry. Um, and one of the ways that, that you've used that is with the Soil Association. So how long have you been involved with them and what's some of the stuff that you're most proud that um, that you've achieved with, with the Soil Association? So I've been involved in various guises with the Soil Association for almost 30 years in that I was wow. a trustee and chair back in the uh, in the 70s, sorry, the 70s and the 90s, <laughs> not that old. Um, and uh, then I became their food and farming director in uh, 2004 and then went off and worked for the National Trust for a while and came back as chief exec. So I've had this ongoing, I can't quite leave in very, ways. And I guess the reason for that is that there are very few, I can't think of any other organisations that really try, uh, really cover the breadth of farm to fork, if you want to use that slight cliche, um, and understand that we can't just tackle one issue on its own. Uh, We need to be looking at all of the issues we're trying to tackle and find holistic solutions, systems-based approaches, which actually uh, deliver against all of those targets. So a very good example is at the moment everybody's got climate change in mind. Thank goodness, that's great. But if you just tackle climate change uh, without thinking about biodiversity or thinking about human health, you end up with very different approaches, very different solutions than if you actually take on board the fact that we also need to be reversing the biodiversity crash and feeding people healthily and well. So I think it's that holistic vision that really um, uh, attracts me. It makes it a much more complicated organisation Uh, because we're running projects on so much stuff from actually our food for life work in schools. I'm deeply proud of that because we are uh, serving uh, to our standards in uh, half the primary schools in in England now. Um, And we're in a lot of schools uh, doing education, growing, cooking, uh, getting kids out onto farms. So there's a huge amount of work going on through food for life, which I'm really, really chuffed about. And now we're taking that into other settings like hospitals and care homes. Um, So really looking at nutrition and how we can use food uh, to connect people with the things that are really important in life. And then the work we do with farmers, we we support a lot of farmer-based research. Um, Most research happens in a lab over here somewhere and then everybody does a lot of hand-wringing saying, wow, those stupid farmers picking up on all this stuff that we're inventing over here. Well, most of it has been about trying to sell farmers more inputs, more products. And secondly, uh, those farmers haven't been, uh, you know, it's not in their name. This is not driven by their needs necessarily. So we actually support farmers to uh, come together and tackle a challenge. And we give small grants to those farmers through a a project called Innovative Farmers um, to actually do their own research and value their own knowledge and skills and the time they're putting into this. And some really extraordinary and interesting results are coming out of all of those uh, research projects, those field labs, as we call them. 
So we're doing a whole, you know, we're doing a whole range of stuff. And over the last few years too, uh, we've really re-embraced the forestry agenda. So we have a forestry certification business, which is certifying over 15 million hectares of forest globally in about 50 countries. Um, so that whole interface between what we eat and how that's impacting on uh, deforestation, particularly in the tropics um, and protecting uh, the natural grasslands worldwide is an incredibly important agenda. So issues like palm oil, soya, uh, all those conflicts between you know beef and animal feed and uh, deforestation are really alive uh, and with us. So we do a lot of stuff that just gives you a snapshot of the breadth of stuff that we're doing. Um, but it's endlessly fascinating. I feel as though even though I've been involved for all this time that I'm still learning stacks every day. Um, and I've got a fantastic crew of really bright and motivated people um, actually championing all this work that's that's phenomenal i could spend i could spend three hours just <laughs> quizzing you on some of the stuff you mentioned then in passing and i'm going to ask you a couple of questions but i didn't realize this, so the soil association is global then it's not just a so a, it's a uh, british as I, said, I mean we our, our focus uh, on our most of our campaigning work is is uk but we do have uh, we do certify work widely so we are we're a membership charity so we're supported by the public but we have a business which does auditing and certification on organic most of the organic is in the UK, but forestry internationally. Um, and we work um, internationally with other organisations, um, particularly in the organic world. Um, and we were founder members of things like the Forest Stewardship Council and the Inter International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movement. So we have this kind of focus in the UK, but actually uh, uh, quite a global reach as well. Amazing. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned food for life and, and primary schools. And I think you said that half of kids' lunches now come with... What was that soil association or that, that's not yes. half or organic or no it's just... not half or organic so it's we we, we started a, a program called food for life served here which is um basically a, a, a sort of bronze silver and gold award for menus um and those menus uh need to be meeting certain criteria to to, to reach those awards and at bronze it's about getting rid of the nasties it's about making sure that it's at least red tractor assured which at least gives you the sort of safety the baseline of uh, these farms have been inspected and assured it's making sure that uh, food is freshly prepared, um, and uh, which in itself is and has you know that there is it is nutritionally sound. And then when you get to silver and gold, you start to bring in organic um, and uh, at least RSPCA Freedom Foods for uh, so it's a sort of standard of standards at gold, and we've got an increasing number of schools getting to gold, the menu is at least 15% organic. Um, and so that's a small, you know, we'd love to see it 100% organic, but actually it gives a framework for caterers and school cooks uh, to be able to uh, show where what they're able to achieve, to make sure the, new, the, the, the lunch, the, the meals are nutritionally balanced and that they are sourced in a more sustainable way. It's not perfect, but it's a hell of a big step in the right mm, direction. Yeah. And it feels like such a, a, a no-brainer that clearly our relationship with food should start school. Is that coming from the schools being motivated or you predominantly having to deal? Because my understanding is a lot of school lunches now are provided by <laughs> fairly big catering organisations that may supply a number of schools. They're yeah. obviously trying to do that on a real budget. So are you dealing more with the independent schools or actually are you dealing directly with these with these catering companies? We're dealing uh, a lot with the catering companies. So uh, it helps for the catering companies to be able Able to approach local authorities that they're tendering and saying we can achieve this food for life award so we very to get the volume you need to be working with the, with the progressive caterers um, but we do de deal with groups of schools as well we do the training for school cooks um, so really trying to um, enable and what what the way it works now it was funded initially by the big lottery and now we're commissioned by local authorities um, particularly in more deprived areas of England uh, to actually help uh, upgrade, if you want, the school food across their their jurisdiction. Um, so we're working in Oldham and Hull and Stoke and Leicester and, you know, places where actually poor nutrition is a real, uh, a real concern where obesity levels are high um, and where uh, kids are really failing on getting anywhere near their five a day. And we've been able to show that through uh, the Food for Life program that we can uh, massively increase the uptake of, of, of fruit and vegetables uh, into those schools. And we've got a great evidence base 
space. So that's why we're commissioned to actually deliver this through caterers and directly into schools um, by local authorities and Public Health England. Does that mean you get uh, government funding as well? Because it sounds like such an important opportunity. And 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 again, how we miss getting kids to be you know to have nutrition and to understand mm. about fruit and vegetables. And you know, again, the long term impact is just you know just on the NHS. It feels like it should be really well supported and really well funded and yeah. a core part of our of our curriculum and what we do is it so in england it's not government uh funded it's funded by local authorities uh in scotland uh it is funded by the scottish government so the scottish government has really embraced food for life and uh our team up there are um are funded by the scottish government who really do see that this is not only nutritionally important but also economically important actually too because we can show that if you start to source more locally um and to higher quality uh you really benefit the businesses in that area you get a Real, really rapid payback. So there's a whole load of motivations, but um, uh, the the bottom line is uh, if we can uh, feed kids better. I mean, as you say, you know, as a as a farmer, I spend more time, I think, thinking about the nutrition of my animals than we tend to think about the nutrition of our children, and that's a scandal because we are just building such a big problem for further down the line. And we know how much how much diabetes, type two diabetes, is costing us now. We know much how, how obesity is costing. And uh, we need to get into the mindset where we invest ahead of the curve to prevent problems that will be very expensive for us further down the line. And that's a huge challenge for governments who tend to be elected on short-term cycles and are only uh, applauded for what they've done yesterday for today, rather than uh, thinking longer term. But we need as a society to think longer term and to invest in the right things so that we actually make it far cheaper. We can't continue to fund the NHS if we continue to generate the levels of morbidity that we're currently um, uh, generating, the, the amount of ill health we're currently uh, 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 generating. So we've got to change and Food for Life is a big part of that change. Yeah, amazing. And I think scandal is a, is a really good word. It does it does feel uh, scandalous. And that other thing of, of you know investing your energy in the right solutions, because you know, again, as a restaurateur, I get I get uh, concerned when you hear about the government doing things like stipulating that every single dish on the menu has got to have its calorific content on it. And then I look in my kitchen and the chefs and I recognise that the ingredients that are coming in every day uh, are different. And that yeah. actually chef will taste the food and he'll adjust the recipe depending on the food. And actually you go, well, actually, if, you, if you're just going to become obsessed about calorific content, you're going to end up with everything just being made in a factory. Absolutely. And we're going to lose that connection with where food comes from. And that's not the solution. And it's so frustrating to see them just basically going yes let's have more venture capitalist factory driven kind of like you know formulaic dull stuff mm. for lots of reasons that annoy me apart from the fact it's, it's it's the wrong solution you're investing in the wrong part of the uh, of the equation yeah i mean i think it's great to you know where you do have factory made food i think it's great to have calorie uh, you know uh, and i think it's great to have it in you know if, if, if when you've got those standardized ghastly menus then let's put the calories on but you're right uh you know it, for most of us we're making food fresh it will vary from day to day Day, you ser- it's about real food to me, not about uh, just getting us too hung up on the whole calorie thing in a very yeah. unhealthy way. At the same time, when I go out to eat, I want chefs to be caring for my health in the way that they are preparing dishes. Um, and uh, so I think there it is making sure, you know, I've, I have been in plenty of, uh, of restaurants where, you know, food is massively oversalted or uh, clearly they're, you know, j- just just because they know that's a cheap and easy way to make something taste yummy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just the, the kind of, the, the, that's probably the French classic kind of history of cooking as well, but too much butter, too much yeah. cream. And actually you can make a lovely soup that doesn't need any 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 cream in it. And, uh, and it will be healthier for you and just get the, the vegetables and the zings of the spices and all that kind of stuff but i do that's been a challenge for us is this it's coming from the you know consumer demand is there around nutrition and health and fitness to an extent although still fish and chips and burgers sell the most but actually getting the chefs to come on that journey where their obsession is around flavor and say yeah flavor's great but why can't we get that flavor in a whole food nutritional kind of way and not that's the effort i want chefs to be making so that i can eat out without feeling constantly like oh my god i've got to pay for that for the next three days um and uh i think i think it's in our own interest to make sure that people go away from a meal feeling great uh not feeling a bit kind of you know lethargic it's true um 
conscious of time, but also a couple of couple of other points. So you mentioned um, research and and some of this sort of stuff is extraordinary. I think was the word you use, sort of uh, results that are coming out. Some of the research that's being done with the farmers. What sort of stuff is is coming out? So, I mean, just we're running about 44 field labs at the moment. And uh, just to give you a flavour of the diversity of work, I guess we've been doing through that. Things like, uh, which might feel slightly wacky, like using compost teas to control uh, fungicides and fungal diseases in um, uh, in arable crops. So, you know, again, sort of quite, quite, that might feel a little bit wacky, but has been a really interesting one in, in some of its preliminary work. Looking using insects for um, uh, protein sources for poultry, again, trying to get away from using soya. You know, glyphosate, Roundup has been very controversial. So one of the field labs we're running is how to uh, do min till, minim, minimal tillage without using chemicals. So how to destroy your cover crops without spraying them. Um, uh, the neonicotinoid chemicals, again, have been very controversial and now banned. And obviously, rape con- producers are very concerned about that. So we're doing some trials this year on uh, whether if you uh, mow the oilseed rape um, to kind of uh, reduce the amount of foliage uh, late in the winter, whether that cuts the flea beetle populations. Um, controlling apple scab uh, through the use of willow chip, wood chip, so some a real variety of stuff actually fascinating work for me anyway mm. I mean, i'm just so <laughs> pleased that people concentrate on that sort of stuff because i think i i agree it's fascinating but i also recognize man my head's full of so much stuff and the, and the fact that somebody has taken on that role and is doing that kind of research is so important isn't it it's a lot of that come down to you know again as a consumer at a basic level we hear you know the plight of the bees i suppose and pollination um is that one of the key challenges around this kind of you know overuse of the land or is that is that a bit of an urban myth are there other things we should be focusing on more than than that diversity to, to support the insects that pollinate all of our crops. So I think everyone's been quite focused on bees over the last few years, which is great. Um, but I think what's come through more recently is that we have a massive crash in insect populations, um, probably worldwide, certainly across Europe, and that I think has shocked all of us to recognise that some, you know the, the level of decline in very very few years. Now the research coming through now seems to suggest this is about pesticides largely. Um, um, and uh, so pesticides have been used at greater and greater toxicities over the last uh, few decades. Um, and alongside getting rid of habitat, um, you know, actually these great monocultures of crops uh, and uh, and I think climate change will have a, is already starting to have an, a bit of an impact too. Uh, all of those put together is, are, is really jeopardizing one of the fundamental building blocks of our whole ecosystem, the insect population. So this is something Thing that needs urgently tackled. To me, to me, I think the case is made that we have to get off pesticides. We have to get off that treadmill now um, and start looking at other techniques, which is why the kind of work that Innovative Farmers is doing feels really, really important, that we need a lot more of that kind of work that gives farmers confidence um, that if we take the crutch of pesticides away, that they will still be able to grow good crops. Yeah. And again, it feels as a layman that we've got this uh, juxtaposition, I suppose, between an, an increasing popula- population and the fact we're going to get to 10 billion people and this increasing recognition, I suppose, of the fragility of, of Earth and the fact that the trajectory is is harming that. I actually went and saw Brian Cox a couple of days ago on a, a cosmo- cosmo- <coughs> excuse me, a cosmology lecture and saying that, you know, just how unique Earth may be. And although there's something like 20 billion potential other planets that are in a similar ecosystem to Earth, for reasons that I couldn't understand because he's way more intelligent than me, he was making the point that, you know, Earth may be completely unique, unique in the universe. And and that's actually pretty scary because you're like, wow, if we screw this up, you know, yeah. it, it, it may be on its own. So how do we, you know, how do we, because because whilst I support the idea of, of organic, I seem to recognise the fact that industrialization increases yield. So we've got this position where we've got a lot more people. We need the efficiency and the yield. Can we achieve that without doing the pesticides and the detrimental stuff that we're doing on the planet? Or is this is this a genuine problem we don't know how to solve yet? I think that uh, there was a report produced just a few weeks ago. In fact, we launched it in the UK just uh, last week, um, having got it translated. Uh, uh, which is which is by a French research institute called IDRI, which looks at if we were to convert the whole of 
of Europe into organic type systems, agroecological systems, what would the impact be on us being able to feed ourselves, etc.? And I think that should give us huge confidence that this is not only possible, uh, but actually necessary. Um, so the the benefits, yes, we reduced the yield, we reduced the amount of food that was being produced in Europe by about 30%. Um, but we also reduced all the impacts on deforestation. We stopped importing all this feed, we, you know, for animals. We reduced it, the, the, the sort of modeling, reduced uh, the amount of pigs and poultry we produce across Europe um, substantially, but maintained a lot of the ruminant livestock, which is so important for biodiversity and for maintaining in grasslands across Europe. So it reduced our greenhouse gas impacts by 40%, but actually also managed to maintain impact Import, uh, exports and fed people uh, a, a healthy diet against the sort of reference diet that they were using. So I think all of this is very possible. Um, we are wasting too much food. You know, something like 30% of our food gets wasted. Uh, and I think there's a little bit of the feeding the world narrative, which is trying, it's a lot, there's a lot of vis vested interests in maintaining the status quo. And I think sometimes the whole feeding the world narrative is being used to drive agribusiness in the way that it has been driven for the last 50 years. Um, and I think that this new report uh, shows that we can get off that treadmill, uh, feed people people well and reduce our environmental impacts uh, very, very rapidly. So yeah, I think we need to go all the way. I think an organic type system uh, should be the baseline everywhere. That doesn't mean to say you won't still need to do specialist stuff around habitat development and protection. You know, there's lots and lots of things to do when you think about the oceans and how we manage our fisheries, uh, but uh, it is doable and um, we should just get on with it now. I'm glad you're so optimistic. It's uh, it's reassuring that somebody who knows as much as you does uh, says that it's it's possible to achieve. Yeah. Um, so off the back of that experience and all of that knowledge, and you you mentioned um, agroforestry as an example earlier, are there some key developments that you think we should be jumping on? Have you seen some stuff that's really exciting where you go, look, that's actually going to make a real difference? And I know you said you're testing some of those some of those things here with diversity, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, I think that we all know we need to be reducing our dependence on livestock and, um, and so the eat less but better quality meat. I think, you know, I think the case is made and we need to be on that uh, trajectory. But we also need to be thinking about what more what do we need to be producing more of and uh for me um systems like permaculture some of the permaculture ideas and agroforestry i think have a huge amount to offer they're increasing the complexity of our growing systems they're capturing light from uh you know another dimension so they're much more efficient from a land point of view we always criticize organic because you tend to see particularly in cereals a yield reduction but if you bring trees, fruits, nuts, other types of trees into the cropped environment, you can uh, you can usually lift yields per acre by about 40 or 50 percent um, because of the way you're actually able to use the land in a more three-dimensional way, sort of three-dimensional farming. So I'm really excited about that. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the nutrients you can produce from an acre, if you are uh, using using trees and nuts and shrubs and bushes, as well as a crop, um, or maybe instead of a crop, uh, which needs planting every year, um, then you can, uh, you can feed a lot of people per unit area of land. But it does mean we need to be shifting our diets. We do need to be eating more pulses, more nuts, more fruit and more vegetables. Um, and if we shift our diets and uh, develop these kind of quite new in the UK systems, um, I think we would have much more varied produce, and that's what we're doing down here, um, and, uh, and be able to feed people healthily and well. Again, it sounds obvious when you say it. And when you talk about sort of, you know, 40% uplift in, in, in yield and the potential impact of that style of farming, it kind of feels like, well, that's great. Good. It works. You know, we should do it. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. So why aren't we? 
Oh, well, well, because it's much more complex to manage. Uh, You've got long lead times between planting trees and getting any production from them. And for a lot of farmers, they can't afford that cash flow, uh, you know, that cash flow lag. Um, There aren't necessarily very clear markets for some of those products yet. Uh, For instance, we're starting to grow walnuts and almonds, and yet there's nowhere to process those nuts in the UK at the moment. So there's a whole infrastructure problem. Uh, There's concerns around labour and managing, uh, you know, need more people to be managing these kind of more complex cropping systems. So I think there's a whole lot of development costs. There's some research that needs doing and there's more uh, uh, there's more development that needs to happen too. So I can completely understand why all bar the most pioneering farmers are kind of saying, oh, yes, we'll wait and see what happens here. Um, and uh, but uh, th- but the idea is right. So I think if we we're going to really put some energy in over the next 10 years in this uh, new world we're moving into, it would be into that whole idea of agroforestry and to say more permaculture type systems, um, which uh, can deliver all these benefits, but where there are some de- some very real challenges for the farmers at the moment, we need a helping hand to get through that development phase. Okay. And what does that helping hand look like? Is that is that government? I think it is government in this instance. I think that, I mean, I think the businesses who are, you know, there's an awful lot of businesses as well who are starting to uh, shift their product range into more vegan and more vegetarian ranges. And I think they need to engage and support those farmers and growers who are starting to uh, experiment with those products because they need to think about where their product's going to come from long term. So I think there's a business opportunities there too. And also also from restaurants and that kind of stuff. Um, but I think fundamentally, government's got to step in here and say, this is a, uh, a transition, a transformation that we need to make. We need to be backing it, uh, supporting it, um, learning from it, learning with farmers over a period of time. Um, and uh, and the money that we're not going to be giving through the basic payment scheme now, uh, a lot more of that should be directed to supporting this uh, transition to a new type of farming that will will benefit biodiversity, it'll benefit our soils, it'll benefit human health, um, and hopefully long term it'll benefit farmers' incomes too, or at least stabilise them. Okay, so it feels like we're at a, you know, maybe a pivot point of, of understanding both from uh, actually agreeing that there's a problem and there's a challenge and that we need to resolve it, but also understanding how to achieve that and, and how to do it. So, um, you know, thanks for, for, for being on the ball and, and pressurising that. Are you getting a fairly positive response? Again, when you mentioned that organic was 3%, if you think of you and your peers and the other farmers across the country, are you still looked at as being the crazy loon? Or are people actually kind of going, even though we can see the challenge of getting there, we understand that's where we will get to. We understand we need to do it. Some of us might go now. Some of us Mm. might take a little bit longer. But is there there at least a general understanding that's the way we need to go? Or are we still at the point where you've got a lot of people to convince that we've actually got a problem? I I feel as though the ground is moving quite quickly. Um, I think there are still a number of people to convince. um, But I think the evidence is stacking up very rapidly. I think there's been a, a really helpful period of time where, as I say, some really major reports have actually given uh, it should be giving people confidence about the direction of travel. So I think I think that is coming through. Um, that's not to say that, you know, the job's done. It's not. And uh, and I think, you know, one of the things I pride myself on and the Soil Association on is that we're also very practical people. So it's all very well having the right theories. It's about making sure this works on the ground. And so the job to do in terms of actually helping it happen, helping it work in real time, in real life, um, is a big task for the next 10 or 15 years. Okay. Is it still your task? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do what I can. Okay. Do you feel overwhelmed because of the, the, the amount of knowledge that you've got and then the the respect I would like to think of your peers because you've been doing this for so long and because you're actually, you know, you're doing the actions that you, you believe in, you're demonstrating it and because you also happen to run, you know, restaurants and hospitality businesses so you see the consumer changes as well. Do you feel overwhelmed by that level of sort of knowledge and thus responsibility or do you, uh, are you pretty relaxed? <laughs> 
I try and stay relaxed because as soon as you start to feel overwhelmed, you're not very uh, effective anymore. I think I'm really lucky to have that mix of practical on the ground experience and real time experience, as well as to have the opportunity to lead an organization which is actually in there, hopefully influencing governments, um, getting uh, involved with business activities. Um, and, uh, and I think it does help to keep it real, uh, you know, to try and keep us focused on solutions, to be both kind of visionary, but also quite pragmatic about what the next steps are. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I'm lucky to have that range of, uh, of, of kind of experience and understanding um, and an amazing team of people who can kind of take some of that and, 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 and make it work. So, yeah, on a good day, um, I'm, I don't know that relaxed, but certainly um, I, I still feel deeply motivated by all of this and uh and privileged to be able to uh both be you know enjoying my farm and loving it and being re-inspired by what we do here um and taking that and trying to make the world a better place too amazing i think that balance perspective means that you know so many people listening will 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 respect and buy into and understand uh, what you're saying because i worry sometimes about the uh, the kind of angry vegans that actually put people off of the nutritional and the health benefits of cutting down our, our meat consumption so the fact that you're actually uh you know a, a farmer and you're rearing animals for you know consumption yet still uh are happy to have that that informed debate about the fact that we should be cutting down and we should be changing our diet mm. and pulses and nuts and, and almonds and walnuts and all the stuff you mentioned is, is important i think uh yeah it means that, that people will, will have a great deal of respect so i'd just like to say thanks on behalf of uh of britain if not the world now that i know that you're actually global in your impact for for doing what you do you you very much deserve that obe and I, I don't know how you get all of the stuff done with all of the groups and government advice and all the stuff you do but is there anywhere that you would like people to go to find out more about you or anything that the public should be doing now to support you and the business and, and and the organisations you work with support, you know, where should they go and what can they do? Well, I would really like them to support the Soil Association. You know, go on to our website. I, you know, I'd love more members. We, it's pathetic. We only have about twelve or 13,000 members and compared to some of the other, you know, big conservation organisations, it's a, a tiny number. And the more people are members and supporting that more balanced approach, trying to get that, um, uh, that mix right, that would be fantastic. Uh, so do get involved in whatever way, you know, uh, people feel they want to. Obviously, buying organic food is a good, great thing to do. Love that. Um, but actually just getting active in this and asking the right questions uh, wherever you go, you know, it, it is complicated. There aren't always black and white answers to stuff. But if we can just demonstrate to government and to businesses that people really care about these issues and will act on the basis of their values, um, then uh, it's remarkable how quickly things can shift. Amazing. Perfect. Well, I will put uh, the website links and the, 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 uh, the um, organizations you mentioned yeah. uh, in the show notes. But uh, yeah, thank you again for what you do with your with your day to day life. But also thank you for sparing the time this morning to have a chat, Helen. And hopefully we can touch base again. I'd love to think that in uh, I don't know how long, but you know, in a, in a decade's time, we'll have nailed some of these issues. Uh, but I share your your kind of, you know, your optimism. And I'm really excited to see where we go. But thank you for sparing the time. Thank you very much. It's been great fun. So there you have it. You have reached the end of another episode of the Humans of Hospitality podcast. I thank you so much for listening. Please go and visit our website, humansofhospitality.co.uk for the show notes and extra episodes and information. And whilst you're there, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter and to receive free materials all about the humans behind our incredible industry. Lastly, if you could subscribe, rate and review this podcast, you will be massively helping me out and it would be hugely appreciated. Thank you so much. We'll be launching another podcast in just seven days time. Cheers. Cheers.